BCC is a multi-site church. If you haven't been around, you might not know that. And what it means is that we are together right now at the same time, even though we're not all in the same place. We do church with a common focused purpose, a calling really. PCC exists to reach people who don't go to church so that we can all experience the fullest lives possible through Jesus. And you'll find that to be the exact same reason we exist regardless of the location that you attend our church. Whether you're at, for example, Aylet or Farmville, campuses that flank our southwest and northeast a part of our footprint, both of those campuses are growing and they're either on the front edge of or already pushing the capacity of their buildings, which is a nice problem to have. It's a healthy problem to have. So I just want to shout out to our Aylet and Farmville campuses today, or maybe you're at church right now at our Riverside campus in Fork Union. Last year, our Riverside campus completed a brand new kids wing uh, in their building, and now that campus has the highest kids ratio of any of our PCC campuses. There are kids everywhere, and it's really exciting. When I am not uh, the teaching pastor here at our church, I try to make it to all of our campuses and uh, I was at our Riverside campus not too long ago. When I go to all these campuses, I always say to the campus pastor, my role here is to serve you. Uh, my role here is to serve you. Whatever it is you need, whatever it is you need me to do on that particular day, anything at all, you just say it. And almost nobody, you know, takes me up on this offer. So I go there it's about a month or so ago and Pastor Stewart comes to me. He's got this panic look on his face just before church starts. And he says, you said you'd do anything. And I said, yeah, I'd do anything. He says... Man, somebody called out and kids today, we really, we really need you. Are, you. are you willing? And I said, what age? Because <laughs> that matters. But I had a great time with kids that day. And uh, so shout out to our Riverside campus. Our Midlothian campus is our oldest multi-site campus. And it's also in our newest building. And at, they're at two services already. They're starting to ask questions about how do we add capacity here because the building is full and we are reaching the community around the Midlothian campus in ways that we always dreamed and believed that we could. And plus, they're also overrun with kids and students, so shout out to our Midlothian campus. And then right here in this room at our Powhatan campus, this is where it all started. And, and this campus is not just geographically at the center of it all, but has become the center of generosity for PCC. When we planted these other campuses, Powhatan has become the enthusiastic resource for funding, for building teams, for leadership. People sometimes have even moved to these other places so that we could reach these other communities too. So shout out to our Powhatan folks today and online. It's always amazing to me the, to see the footprint of PCC with people who come to our church from places far and wide, all over our country, and frankly, all over the world. And, and it always kind of blows my mind. So shout out to our online folks today. And just one more, our Nottaway campus. Nottaway is a full-on legitimate PCC campus that happens to meet at the Nottaway Correctional Center for Men in the gymnasium there. Those guys are as excited about being a part of PCC as we are about being a part of their lives. And men's lives really are being changed there because we invited them not just to watch our church, but to be family with our church. And so I just wanna shout out to the Nottaway guys today. Today, we kick off a brand new series that is really about the lesser known but still very important moments in the Jesus story. See, there are some things that are part of the Jesus narrative that are commonly known by people who have had some exposure to church or even by people who haven't really touched and felt church a lot. There are some things that are just kind of out there, kind of widely known about Jesus. For example, Jesus did some miracles and uh, Jesus was born at Christmas, although I'm sorry to tell you that it was most likely not December 25th when he was born, but that's a conversation for another day. We still celebrate it on that day. And Jesus walked on water and he told parables, stories like the prodigal son. Um, and uh, these are kind of well-known. He was crucified and um, alleged or believed, depending on the camp that you're in, Jesus rose from the dead. 
These are things that are widely known about Jesus, but there are also events in the life of Jesus that people either don't know about at all or know a little bit about, but still don't widely understand. And those moments are not just part of his story. They're not just part of history. They are actually uh, components of information and truth that has an implication for our lives today in our quest to know God. And I want to know God better, and I'm assuming that you do too. In our quest to know God, and in our quest to become more of the person that he wants me to be, these three moments in the Jesus story, which we're gonna unpack in the next three weeks, will help us not just connect with a moment from long ago, but intersect that moment with this one right here. So today, we're going to start with temptation. Okay, sit in that chair. All right, here's the deal. Marshmallow, for you. You can either wait, and I'll give you another one if you wait, or you can eat it now. When I come back, I'll give you two, another one, so then you'll have two. But stay in here and stay in the chair till I come back, okay? okay. All right. Go do something, and then I'll come back. It smells yummy. Oh, it smells really good. So I'm gonna leave and then I'll come back, okay? So you can either eat it right now or you can wait. Either way, okay? Okay. How'd you do? Did you do good? You did? Yeah. You wanted to eat it, didn't you? Yeah. So did I tell you to give me another one? Okay, now you can have both. You need them. <laughs> All right, let's be honest. That's how you would do it. I mean, I would stuff them both in. I'd ask for a third one. My favorite was a little girl who thought she could eat all the way around it and it wouldn't count. It's so hard, right? It's sitting right there with that delectable, irresistible, alluring sweetness just four inches from your face fighting the voices of reason that are quickly losing the battle with your mind. 
several of the kids, I found this fascinating because partly because it was a little bit convicting, they decided to resist the temptation by actually getting closer to it. They leaned in. They put their face right in front of it. They thought they could stare it down, hold it in their hand, take the tiniest of a sample from it, just the smallest taste. One kid put the thing all the way in, took it all the way out again. It closed the gap until it's right under their nose. It's sugar-filled fragrance performing the opposite of the desired effect, right? They're hoping that the aroma will offer some measure of satisfaction for them, but it only increases the enticement, right? Now all of their senses are fully engaged in this moment, and the longer they sit with it, the worse it gets, and some gave in. And if they stayed there long enough, if they stayed close enough to the, to the temptation for long enough, well, eventually all of them would be consumed by the temptation and would consume the marshmallow. Wouldn't it be nice, though, if all temptation was so harmless? Wouldn't it be nice if our poorest moments resulted in us having a good laugh together and a good story to tell and a funny video to share? But that's not reality, and we all know it. I mean, truth be told, our temptation often takes us down a very different path. And consequences of that path are often lasting and hurtful and costly. And look, if you think I'm, you know, just talking about you, I've got good news or not. But the truth is, nobody gets a pass on temptation. Nobody. The voices come to all of us. They're different voices for different people, but they are all there. We all have them. They're voices that say things like we should deceive our spouse or our friend or our employer, that we should disrespect our parents, that we should distort the truth, that we should disown our identity, that we should dishonor a friend that we should create distance between ourselves and God. Everybody gets tempted, even Jesus, which is our plot twist today. What made Jesus remarkable, or at least one of the things that made Jesus remarkable, was not his perfection in the lack or absence of temptation, but his perfection in spite of temptation. In case you don't know, Jesus actually was tempted with things a bit more enticing than a marshmallow. And his victory over temptation can provide a roadmap for our victory over it too. So we're going to begin with a story told in Matthew chapter 3 that goes like this. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. And then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now, the sequence of events here is important. I want you to imagine this. For 30 years, Jesus' entire life, really, because he's about 30 at this moment, his whole life has been building to this event right here. He has been trained. He has prayed. He has practiced. He's gone through the whole cycle of religious rituals of his day. And after all of that time and all of that preparation, Jesus finally gets to his baptism, which means he can finally launch his ministry. And I, I try to insert myself in scripture. I try to see it like it was happening, like it's happening in this moment. I like to, I, I try to feel it like it was, like I was in the story because it helps me internalize it better. So I think to myself, if that was me, if I'd been building my whole life to this, if I knew now that my ministry would begin, how would I be handling this baptism moment? Well, I would be standing in my baptism water, scanning the banks, looking for people to recruit to be a part of the movement I'm about to launch. And, and I would say, I've got to organize a team and I need team members. So there's an action-oriented guy right there. I think I'll ask him and there I'll ask that girl over there and that one over there. And I would be organizing this team and I would have to organize an event because every good ministry begins with an event, right? So I need to name it something compelling. 
And I wrote down a few ideas. Uh, you know, the, the nice thing about brainstorming is you know some ideas aren't good. So my first idea for how to name this event is I think we'll call it the pre-ministry leadership and miracle training day. That's awful, isn't it? It's terrible. Who would come to that? Let's just scratch that off. All right. How about this idea? How about how to walk on water in three easy steps? <laughs> Somebody probably come to that. Okay. Uh, here's one that could be relevant to some people here today. How to cast out that demon from your relative. That one's got some merit. All right, and then how about this one? Instantly turn water into award-winning wine. Oh, yeah. We'd sell that event out. Okay, so I need some speakers at this event. I'm going to ask John the Baptist, since he just did the honors with me, and I'm going to talk to that Peter guy who seems to never be able to shut up. And then we'll get Martha and Mary to do the food, right? And we need some wine. Nah, just some water. But... Jesus doesn't do any of those things. He doesn't plan an event. He doesn't build a team. He doesn't make some asks. He doesn't do any kind of organizational structure. He doesn't start his long anticipated ministry at all. Instead, Matthew tells us that Jesus heads into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And I find the placement of Jesus's temptation here to be telling and informing for me in my life. Both Matthew and Luke tell us that Jesus experienced an intense time of temptation immediately following the spiritual high of his baptism. Don't miss this point. You and I are most susceptible to temptation. Counterintuitively, when we are riding the triumphant high of a spiritual moment or an encounter with God, because in that moment, we think we've, we're so close with God that we let our external guard down. Maybe we wander into dangerous areas. Maybe we blur the lines. After all, we're this close with God. How can we go wrong? Or maybe like in the case of Jesus, it's God himself that we're following. Because when we follow God, it costs us something and it usually leads us into dangerous places for the sake of expanding the kingdom. That's what God does with us. And it's at that moment, following our spiritual high point, that the enemy comes along and offers us an easy way to live, not the hard way of following Jesus. After 40 days, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus was hungry. And the tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread, food. Now there's a temptation. It's, it's certainly one I struggle with. I asked a message help question about this. I do this sometimes. I put it on social media, message help question. And I asked, what, what's your temptation? And we got lots of responses. We seem to be tempted by lots of things, but none more than food. And you know, it's not an accident. Sweets are my thing, my downfall. I fight them pretty much every day. That's not, that's not a joke. I lose sometimes, I win sometimes. I certainly don't win all the time. But you know, it's not an accident. You know, there's actually sort of a conspiracy if you're a conspiracy kind of person. I found out about a guy named Michael Moss who wrote a book called Salt, Sugar, and Fat. I did not buy the book. I will not read the book too convicting. But anyway, Michael Moss wrote this book salt, called Salt, Sugar, and Fat, and in it, he talks about how there is a person, there's a group of people you can hire, they're called Crave Consultants, and companies actually hire them. And they come in, and their job is to identify your bliss point, that's what they call it, so that they can create their product and market it in such a way that it entices you, and they win, and you lose. Now, I don't know if marshmallow companies have Crave consultants, but I guarantee you Krispy Kreme does. And all them ice cream co folk and companies, I, I guarantee you they do. Now, some people argue that Jesus wasn't really tempted. I mean, he was, he was the son of God after all. He was divine. But the truth is, in a way that I, I can't fully explain, in a way that none of us can really understand on this side of heaven, Jesus was fully tempted. God, but he was also fully 100% human. And what that means is that he completely, totally experienced real hunger during this fast. F 
Fasting, if you don't know, is a way of devoting myself fully to God by denying myself of something I want or something that I need, something like food. I've fasted from food several times in my life. It's almost always been a rewarding spiritual experience for me, and I know people who do this regularly as a part of their spiritual discipline. And then they would say that it's incredibly rewarding. But the fast that we read about by Jesus is incredibly long, 40 days without food. He would be unspeakably hungry, really. Words couldn't describe how hungry he would be. His body had long ago eaten all of its reserves and now would be eating its own muscle. And the tempter, and I like the way Matthew calls him the tempter, the tempter comes along at Jesus' weakest physical moment and he starts to try to play with his mind. And if you look carefully, the tempter doesn't really make Jesus a real offer. I mean, it's not a real offer. It's not like he opens up a Weber grill and there's some you know, corn on the cob and some kebabs and a steak grill in there. And he says, how about you have a bite? He doesn't do that. Instead, he takes stones. He basically dangles a handful of gravel in front of the one who has the power to turn it into a five-course meal. And he says, why not? What would it hurt? Doesn't God want you to be fulfilled? Isn't that what he wants for you? And this is the same pitch when we boil it down. It's the same pitch the tempter makes to you and to me. It's really about the temptation of appetite. And I promise you it's about far more than food. The tempter convinces us, or at least tries to convince us, that God is okay with you having whatever you want. Whatever we feel, whatever we desire, what would it hurt? Why is it so bad? Why why, why shouldn't you look at that? Would God have made me this way if he didn't intend for me to act on these natural urges? Why should I deny myself, my attraction, my craving, my desire? And, And gosh, in Jesus' case, he could say, I've already denied myself in devotion to God. How much sacrifice does he want? It's been 40 days since I've eaten. Isn't that enough? Doesn't God want me to be happy? If you've been coming to our church for a while, maybe today's your first day, but for those who've been around for a while, you know, we almost never talk about the devil. I, I, all due respect, I think there are people who give the devil way too much attention. I'd rather spend all my energy focusing on who God is and and who I am because of Jesus than commit any real effort to the the one who's trying to pull me away from him. But but there are moments, and and this is one of them. I mean, it's hard to deny that the tempter is real, not just in my life from experience, but in the Bible itself who refers to the evil one, the devil, the tempter. It seems to me then that one of the tempter's most successful ploys is to try to infiltrate the minds and the hearts of people who want to follow God. We want to follow God. And then instead of just saying, don't do that, he says, well, really, if you want to follow God, don't you know that God just wants you to have everything you want? It's, it's sort of a it's, it's a peripheral attack. He's trying to come at us from the flank. It's really not a head-on attack because he knows better than that. He's smarter than that. And so he says, God just wants you to have whatever you want. That's, a love, that's what a loving God will do. And logically, we know this makes no sense. It really flies in the face of, of good sense. We know that giving somebody everything they want all the time is a bad idea, even for ourselves. Still, how you know you're in trouble is we'll start to rationalize taking the tempter's seed that he plants. We will rationalize giving into temptation, get this, using spiritual language. Makes it seem like satisfying my every physical desire like hunger or whatever is always God's will for me. Doesn't God want you to be satisfied? Does he want you to be hungry? But more than being physically well-fed, What God really wants is for your soul to be nourished. And listen, sometimes you can't do both. Look at how Jesus responds. He answers, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. 
but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus quotes here a well-known piece of scripture that all of his original hearers would know. It's from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. And if, you're, if you've been a churchgoer for a while, if you're a follower of Jesus, you might have heard this story. You might know that Jesus is quoting a, this one piece of scripture from uh, the Old Testament, but you might not know the larger context of the story. And it has a much more pervasive truth, one that will help us today. And I want to read it to you. And it's just a little bit heavy, but stay with me. You'll see how it ties together. It only takes a second. This is God speaking to his people a few thousand years before Jesus' encounter with the tempter in Matthew. It goes like this. God says to them, be careful to follow every command I'm giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness the, these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Can you see the parallels here? After the miraculous exodus and the parting of the Red Sea, the people of God are led by God into the wilderness for 40 years to be tested. After the miraculous baptism and the parting of heaven, the Son of God is led by God into the wilderness for 40 days to be tested. Hunger came to Moses hunger came to Jesus. And the purpose for both of these events was the same, to teach us that our existence is not dependent only on physical sustenance, but on spiritual truth too. And the way that you really learn that life comes from the word of God is to live your life on the word of God. Until you have to rely on God for your life, it's just an academic religious exercise. It's just head knowledge. That's why I read and study the Bible every day. It's not to impress people with what I know. God is not impressed with my level of spiritual trivia. It is so that I can live and breathe on the word of God. I want to have at the ready the truths about God and about me and about life so that when the tempter comes, and says something to me like, you need to make your own plan. God has abandoned you. I can say like Joshua did that God will never leave me and he will never forsake me. I can speak Jeremiah's truth that God does have a plan for my life and it is not for my harm, it is for my success. And when the tempter comes and says, what's wrong with another drink, it's all good. I can respond with Paul's words that he wrote to the Corinthians that said, it might all be permissible, but that doesn't mean it's all helpful. And when the tempter says to me, what does it hurt if you look at that website? I can say what John said, that the lust of the eyes comes not from God, but from the world. And when I want so badly to give just a little and to keep a lot, to help just a little and to hoard a lot, I can recite Jesus's words that say where my treasure is, that's where my heart actually will be. So the greatest source of life is not found in food. It is not found even in oxygen. It's not found in pleasure, certainly. It is found in the word of God, spoken from his lips to our ears through the richness of the truth that we have accessible to us like no other people in human history. It is literally in your pocket. We must have it. We must read it. We must crave it. We must live on it because man does not live on bread alone but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. But that's not the only temptation. So the second, so after Jesus does that and rebukes the devil, then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. On the surface, this looks like sort of a classic, let's bargain with God scenario. If God lets me jump off this cliff, then he, it must be his will to then save me. So I can just justify anything that I do and use God, blame it on God, 
if the bad thing still happens. I don't know what God, God, I don't know where God went. I, you know, I'm just living some crazy life and God's supposed to rescue me from all of it. I'm going to give you a spiritual truth right here that you're going to need. This is going to be profound. It's complicated. It's complicated. You might need to write this down. Here it is. God will let you be as dumb as you want. God will let you be as dumb as you want. It's not his fault when you crash. God will allow us to make our own choices. In fact, listen, the only time in the entire Bible, and I've read it several times, cover to cover, the only time in the entire Bible that God invites us, encourages us, encourages us even to test him is when it comes to radical generosity, never when it comes to self-serving purposes or just testing God for the heck of it. This is ultimately a ploy for approval. That's what this temptation is about. It's about status. It's about ego. It basically says, I, can't, I just can't possibly go wrong here. I'm too important to God. Or God just you know, wants to make sure that no matter how dumb I am, nothing bad is ever going to happen to me. Even if I head towards a crash, God's going to bail me out. He's going to save me from disaster. He's going to rescue me from my stupidity. And, it, and it's, it is completely outside of any teaching in the Bible. People say, I've actually had somebody say to me, uh, if God didn't want me in this much debt, he would have never allowed the loan to be approved. What? What? Or we bargain with God. We say, God, you know, I know this is not really what you want for me, but if you'll just let me, you know, have it or do it or whatever, then, you know, and then we make some you know, some pledge like, I'll never miss church again forever, as if God really needs you to show up every Sunday for the rest of your life or, you know, to do whatever, whatever else it is you're bargaining with God with. I mean, if you play with fire, we know this is true. If we play with fire long enough, sooner or later, we're going to get burned. And that is not God's fault because we're testing God and he never told us it was okay. And Jesus knows this is dangerous. So once again, Jesus returns to Scripture. Satan this time quotes Scripture. Jesus quotes it back to him. A scripture from Deuteronomy again. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. And then there is one more, a final third temptation, and it goes like this. Again, the devil took Jesus to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their splendor. All this I will give to you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me and Jesus said to him away from me Satan for it is written worship the Lord your God and serve him only and then the devil left him and angels came and attended him this final temptation is um, the downfall of many really good people seriously just in the past few weeks we've had these three bank failures and they've followed uh, they've been followed by investigations now into some suspicious stock sales by executives who at least appeared to uh, want to have some personal gain at the expense of other people's loss. All this I will give to you, the devil said, if you will worship me. This is the temptation of ambition and it's super powerful, particularly in our culture today. And I, I'm just going to confess to you because we, we get real here. Uh, if I had to pick a temptation that was most likely to succeed for me, the one that I'm in most danger of always, this is it. This is mine. I have to work really hard at keeping in check my ultimate and only allegiance. Sometimes I have to say out loud, my whole life exists to serve only God. No one else, especially me. My whole life exists to serve only God. Jesus gave us an essential way to win over temptation. We can win. We have the power to win, the power in us. I have to increasingly know who God is, and critically, I have to know who I am in him. The devil knew who God was. I have to know who I am in God. In fact, this is the piece I really wanted to show to you. It's the common thread that links all three temptations together into one meta theme that is always at the source, the foundation 
of the devil's attempt to tempt us. His plot against us is always an attack ultimately on our identity. The enemy wants you to question who you are, who you really are, because if he can do that, he can win. Listen to what he did with Jesus. Listen to his words. If you are the son of God, turn this stone into bread. If you are the son of God, jump off the cliff. If you are really a worshiper, worship me. Each of these three temptations critically, not accidentally, go after Jesus' very identity because if the enemy can get Jesus to compromise who he is, then he can easily affect whatever he does. If he can get Jesus to compromise who he is, he can easily affect whatever he does. And it's the exact same tactic that the enemy uses with you and me. If you don't know who you are, you have no grounding to resist the temptation that is coming at you. And temptation is coming. It's always coming. But when we know who we belong to, when we know who God is, and when we know who I am as a follower of Jesus Christ, well then we've solidified our identity. And then I have what I need to resist temptation and to win every time, just like Jesus taught us to do. So listen, who God made you to be, that is enough. You are enough, just like you are. You don't need some additional exterior trappings. You don't need more achievements. You don't need the approval of other people and you don't need a new identity. You have an identity, whether you know it or not. You are a child of God and you don't get to determine your identity and people around you don't determine your identity. God does. If you will ground yourself in who you are in Jesus, then you, like Jesus, can overcome all the temptation, every temptation that comes your way. I keep fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough. Every single lie that tells me the sun
what God says about you, that you're loved and strong, that you're his. We learn from Jesus that that's the secret. We can withstand the temptations about appetite, approval, and ambition if our identity is found in God. So come back next week for another plot twist about Jesus. Have a great week, and we'll see you next Sunday. <laughs>